enter into our time of worship by going to God in prayer. Lord God, great I am, you are living water. As we worship you this day, show us who we are, channels of your love and vessels of your grace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Good morning. Would you stand, please, and join me with, in the responsive call to worship? As God sent Abram, Sarai, and Lot on a journey, God calls us to follow in trust. God is able to make us more than we have been and blesses us on the way. As Jesus invited Nicodemus to be born again, Christ invites us to become a new creation. Christ calls us out of the darkness and into his marvelous light, and we are saved through him. Would you turn to number 839, please, in your hymnals? We'll sing verses 1 and 3 of Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. We saw, yes, or saw last week, rather, that in faith and through God's love, we are claimed and we are named by God. We are claimed in these waters that remind us wherever we go, God is with us. God is loving us. God will never leave us. Let us give thanks and be happy. We cannot earn God's grace or favor. It comes to us, not as something owed, but as a gift freely given. Confident in God's love for us, even when we are ungodly, we confess our sins in faith. Gracious God, we come before you in need of forgiveness and grace. You call us to trust in you completely, but we do not. We are timid and fearful as we follow your lead. We justify our actions and words, though we know they are not what you require. We struggle to understand the new life Christ offers, preferring old habits to risky change. Forgive us, we pray. Help us to be born again into the life of Christ trusting that you have included us by grace in the family of faith. In Christ's name we pray, amen. 
Friends, God is for us and not against us. For that very reason, God sent the Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but the, that the world might be saved through him. Believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. the video that uh, some people come to church um, on a motorcycle, right? Mm -hmm. um, how many of you came to church on a motorcycle today? Nobody? What did you come to church today in? In a car? car. Okay. Yeah, lot, lot, lots of us take cars or trucks or things like that. Um, Every Sunday when I invite all of you to come down here and we talk a little bit and pray a little bit, um, how, how do you get down here from, from where you sit? Walking down the stairs. You walk. You use your feet, right? You walk. Um, how many of you have taken a vacation? How many of you have taken a vacation where you had to fly in an airplane? Some of us have. Some of us have. Okay, so all these ways, uh, motorcycles, cars, trucks, our feet, airplanes, what, what do they all have in common? They're all ways from getting one place to, to the other, to some other place. Now, I mentioned last week we were going to talk about uh, different things that uh, people for years and years, even centuries, have done to deepen their faith. Last week we talked about fasting, right? which is when we give something up, and we talked about how hard that could be, like if you gave up candy, and what did I have in my hands? I had candy, yeah. Um, this week, we're actually going to be talking about journeying, but when we journey to a special place to draw closer to God or be closer to God, it has a special name. Do any of you know what that is? It begins with a P. You ever heard the word pilgrimage? Pilgrimage. Pilgrimage. It's a special journey people take. Now, take a look at the screen there. Does that look like an individual that uh, is getting ready to sit still? What, what gives you the impression that that person might be going somewhere? What, what's he holding? He's holding a walking stick. What, what, what's on his back? A book bag. A book bag or, or a pack or supplies, something for the journey. This, a bag. Or a bag. Do, does anyone know who that character is? No. He does kind of look like an elf. He's got pointy ears. He does got pointy ears. But actually, he's not an elf. He is a hobbit. His name is Bilbo Baggins, and if you know anything about the story, you know anything about the story that has Bilbo Baggins and hobbits in it, it all starts with a big journey. He didn't know where he was going to go. He didn't know where it was going to end up, but he went anyway. There's a story in the Bible, the very beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 12, about a man named Abram. A few chapters later, he his name gets changed to Abraham. You've heard of Abraham, right? But Abraham 
there's Abraham Lincoln too. Not the same Abraham. Uh, not the same Abraham. Um, but the first thing that Abram did to show his faith in God was God told him to take a trip, to go on a journey, and he did. And you know what Abram discovered was no matter where he went, God went with him. It's the same for us in our lives as well. Wherever we go and however we go, whether it's with our feet, in a car, or in an airplane, or some other way, we know no matter where we go, God will go with us. So let us pray before we go back to our seats and thank God for always being with us. Dear God, we thank you that you call us to go to all sorts of places, but even more, we thank you that wherever we go, you go with us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. You may now return to your seats and go with God. Our journey today uh, brings us to our responsive reading from Psalm 121. You can find those words on pages 516 and 517 of your Pew Bible. Uh, in just a moment, uh, I will begin by reading the odd verses. You all may respond with the even verses. But before we read together, uh, either from printed Bibles or the screens, let us first pray for God's wisdom. Living God, through the reading of the scriptures and by the power of your spirit, may we hear for ourselves the good news and believe because of your word that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. Amen. Now let us read together from the book of Psalms, Psalm 121. I'll begin with verse 1. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. A reading from the Old Testament uh, from the very beginning can be found on pages 8 and 9 of your pew Bibles or again on the screens behind me. These words come to us from the book of Genesis chapter 12 verse 1 through 4a. Listen again for God's word. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. This is the word of God. For a wide variety of reasons, um, there's been some constant background noise in my life lately. And the reasons are not really important, but it's been the HGTV television program, Love It or List It. Now, if you've never seen this particular program, the premise of it is quite simple. You take a homeowner that is living in a home that just isn't working for them anymore. They don't like it, things are not working, it's not set up the best way they would like. So the homeowner takes a bit of a journey. In fact, kind of two parallel journeys at the same time. One of those journeys is with a host who specializes in coordinating home renovations. The other, a real estate agent. So. 
In these parallel journeys, one is an attempt to renovate the home, to bring it up to date, to make it more of what they want and need to make their home someone, somewhere they would love to live. The real estate agent on the other journey shows them a series of homes that might work better and that after they fix up the home, they could list it, sell it, and move into this new life. But at the end of each show, the homeowner has a choice to make. Will they love it? That is, will they live in their home going forward, or will they list it, sell it, and move into one of the other homes? Now, to be fair, this show will probably never be filmed in Taylorville. The homes are significantly larger, for the most part, than your average home in Taylorville. They're valued far above what most homes in Taylorville would be valued at. The budgets for renovation, um, you could probably buy a good number of houses in Taylorville just for what they do to fix up the home. The purchasing price that they could buy that new home at, again, above market value here. But if you can get past all of that, even if the show is just background noise for you, it's kind of interesting. What are they going to choose? It would be pretty boring if they always chose to love it or always chose to list it. You have episodes where they do one or the other, but more often than not, if you watch it over and over and over and over and over again, it does skew quite heavily to the idea of loving the home once it's been brought up to scratch. Of course, that fits in with HGTV's demographic. It's about home upgrades and repairs and things you can do to make your home more of a home. But what most folks find, I think, when they decide, nope, we're going to stay, we're going to love it, is that they didn't need a new home. They didn't need all the new bells and whistles. They just needed to live life in a little different of a way. But it doesn't change the fact. There's always that choice. Which way are they going to go? Now, we ourselves, we face a multitude of choices in our lives every, every single day. Every single one of us has already, at this point, just after 10 o'clock in the morning, even if it feels a little bit after 9 o'clock, we've already made dozens of decisions that got us to where we are now. We're going to make dozens more. Circumstances change, but it comes down to some essentials. We have to make a choice, one thing or another. What will we choose? Why will we choose it? What do we look for? What do we value? What's important to us? What is a deal breaker? What can we do without and what is a must have? What limitations will seemingly force us to abandon the path we want to take for the one we need to take? Now, this is the drama of love it or leave it. This is also the drama of our everyday life. It takes on even more significance when we apply it or think of it in more spiritual terms, more godly terms. What informs God's choices, God's values? What does God look for? What is an essential with God, especially when it comes to humans? Now, our reading today was probably one of the more easier readings to find if you cracked open that Bible. Not because it's the most well-known story in scripture, but really how often can we say it's on a single-digit page in the Bible. But it reminds us, this reading comes at the very beginning of the story of God with God's people. It is the beginning. It is the start. It is the foundation of things. This account of Abram and his family and the things surrounding it, they inform everything that's going to come after that point. I would never suggest that one book of the Bible is more important than another, or one story is more significant than another. They are all important. They are all necessary. They all live and work together. But there are some of those stories that seem to come up again and again and again. We read later in Scripture of the same names, the same people, the same situations, Abram and this story of God's calling, this story of God's leading comes up again.
again and again and again. I don't know if you caught it, but our reading is just a little bit over three verses long. Not even a whole four full verses. Yet this choice comes up again and again and again. More than that, what's taking place in that choice not only has had eternal impact, but it is not limited in its scope and impact. It is of universal significance to all of us, even this day. Now, the 11 chapters that precede Genesis 12, they are pretty universal in scope. It talks about God on a grand scale, a cosmic scale, a worldly scale. From that point of view, everything God chooses to do informs how God interacts with this creation. But from this point on, everything will get narrower and narrower and narrower and narrower until it points to one single individual, Jesus of Nazareth. And then from that point, the story gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger again. From this point, Everything that follows is the destiny of God's people, told through the blessing of a single, solitary, otherwise insignificant individual. From Abram, of course, is not born just one people of faith, but people of three main faiths, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, not to say anything of the smaller groups of faith that also honor and venerate Abram. Today, that comprises Faiths that number over 4.3 billion people in the world, well over half the world's population. What was it about him? What was it about this man, this insignificant man in the Middle East so long ago? What is it about what we believe and how we interact with Abram's descendants, whether they be literal biological descendants or spiritual descendants, that has significance? What's it all about? We'll get, that sh get to that shortly, but we first start with where this starts, which is a word of command. Go. Go. Don't stay here. Go. Go. Leave your land. Leave your people. Leave your family. Go. Leave your security. Because that's what family was back then. Go. Leave your identity. You were only known to your family. Go and leave everything that makes you, you. Go, leave all that you know, all that you've ever known, and go somewhere that you do not know and will not know until I tell you. Oh yeah, and by the way, you're not going to know that you got there until I, the Lord, tell you you've gotten there. Oh yeah, by the way, this God is not even known, not even named, not even worshipped at this point. In fact, God's identity is not even revealed for over 40 chapters later when Moses, standing at the burning bush, says, and who should I say sent me when the people ask? Nowadays, when we say, God told me to do this, even though we like to think we know a lot about God, we sometimes raise our eyebrows and say, are you sure? Sounds a little crazy. How much crazier would it be for somebody to say, God told you? Yeah, what God? I don't know. God? In recent years, I've developed a deepening interest in Celtic Christianity. It's an expression of faith that began not only in the British Isles, but parts of Northern Europe as well. It grew up right about the same time the Imperial Church, that church in Rome, was formally acknowledged, formally became the religion of the empire, formally became not only a spiritual power, but a political one as well. Celtic Christianity took a very different path to faith, although Celtic Christianity does have some overlaps, but it does maintain significant particularities. One of them is a threefold understanding of martyrdom, a word from its Greek root that we often think of as death. A martyr is usually somebody who is killed for their faith. But actually, from its Greek root, uh, 
The word martyr actually means to bear witness or to testify to something. Giving one's life, what the Celts would call red martyrdom, that was the rarest, even if it's the most well-known form, of martyring. It is a way of witnessing and testifying to one's faith, to give one's life for what they believe. Much more common, though, and dare we say, much more difficult are the other two forms of martyrdom, green and white martyrdom. It's harder because death, that takes a moment. Green or white martyrdom, that takes a way of life for the duration of life. Green martyrdom is what we commonly associate with Lent. It's the taking up of a spiritual practice or a devotion or a discipline, something we do or something we do without to draw us closer and more dependent on God. White martyrdom, though, what we're talking about here with Abram is the giving up of everything we know, everything we have in our life to follow and place our lives and our destinies firmly in God's providential care. Patrick, who we will remember and celebrate next week with corned beef and cabbage, even though corned beef and cabbage really wasn't a thing when he lived, he gave up the safety he had found in England to return to Ireland where he was a slave to bring the faith to the Irish. Francis gave up his wealth and his privilege in medieval Italy to live and minister among the poor and sick of Assisi and beyond. As we look today at the spread of the coronavirus in northern Italy, we know exactly where Francis would have gone. Oh, just over a century ago, a young Albanian woman named Agnes Bojicu, she left her native homeland to work among the poorest of the poor in Calcutta, India. And of course, we know her by her more common name, Mother Teresa. That is what we're talking about. That is the level of devotion, the level of trust, the level of commitment that is called for in this. This is not going to the store to pick up a few things we need. This is not moving the next town over. This is not even moving to the other side of the country because we have some lucrative job offer waiting for us. No, this is turning decisively, completely, and in all other ways, turning our back on everyone and everything we've ever known even our core identity, and going a completely different way. In Abram's time, your identity was tied, body and soul, with your family. That very unit Abram was called to walk away from. Could you do it? Would you do it? And what would people think if you did? All that was promised to Abram in this was present. In fact, it's not even explicit. God says, I'll tell you when you get to where you're going. And God can only do that if God's present, but God would lead, God would show, God would even reveal, even if God was not then or even now fully known and comprehended. Then there was the promise, I will make of you a great nation. Yes, you. You will leave, you will leave all of this, but there's something more waiting for you. All that that you leave behind, something more is coming. And then the blessing. But the blessing is not for you, Abram. It's not for Sarai. It's not for Lot. But through you, through your family, it's for everyone. Okay, so there has to be something about Abram, right? Something that sets him apart. Something that qualifies him. I mean, when the flood came a few chapters before, Noah was really the only righteous person God could find. So Noah had earned the right to build and live in the ark, right? What is it about Abram? Or maybe it's not Abram. Maybe it is Sarai. Maybe he just married up. Maybe he chose the right life partner. Maybe they did something or demonstrated together. They, they had to earn this, right? I mean, God doesn't just say, hmm, you'll do. Well, Abram was 75 years old, not exactly a spring chicken, not exactly the age any of us would say, yeah, I think it's about time to start a family. Sarai. Sarai, her name literally means barren. 
woman who cannot have children and a 75-year-old, not exactly the most likely of parents. They have no hope, no prospects, nothing that will bring them prosperity, because prosperity is only tied to your children and to your legacy. In fact, what little family they do have, they're about to leave. Through Abram's father, Terah, they found themselves not even in their own native community, the city of Ur, where the ancient city of Babylon is in present-day Iraq. Nope, they're in Haran, a name that literally means crossroads. They are at the crossroads in a city located in what we now call Turkey on the very border it shares with Syria. It wasn't obedience. You know, it wasn't a reward for what Abram had done. He hadn't been asked to do anything yet. It wasn't work. Nothing really special about him. It's not wealth, although as the head of the family, he would have had some resources. No, it is not about who Abram was. It is about who, with God and following God's lead, Abram would become. Abram was chosen for no more and no less a reason than God freely did say, you'll do. You're good enough because I say so. God dared to place all of God's eggs in the basket with Abram's name on it. Of all the ways God could choose to spread blessing, and Genesis 1 through 11 show a whole bunch of ways God tried to spread blessing and it didn't work. Of all the ways God could choose to spread this blessing throughout God's own creation, God chose humans. God chose people. God chose us. So what does that have to do with us? Everything. Before Abram could choose to say yes, to follow God, to, okay, let's see what happens, God first chose Abram. God first chose Sarai. God chose them. God made a promise. And God kept that promise, but for those of us that think saying yes to God means, okay, God's going to give it to us like that, it took another 20 years Actually, no, 25 years. Abram was 100 before that child of promise was born in Isaac. God doesn't say when. God just says it will be. But God also, before we could ever do so, before we could ever think it, before we could ever earn it, before we could ever put up all those reasons we say, hey God, remember me, God chose us, each and every one of us. It's linked with that most common association with John Calvin and his theology, the doctrine of election. It's been misused by many people who thinks it says we're God's special people, that God loves everybody, but God loves us best. But election literally just means God chose us. We didn't choose God, God chose us. The reality is we have done no more or no less to earn God's love and favor than Abram did, and yet God still chose us. In spite of everything we've done, everything we will do, God still chose us. What we do with that reality, that's up to us, but the reality is not changed by it. Our chosenness is not changed by our response. Want to hear something that might or should turn your entire way of looking at life and other people completely upside down? The person in front of you, the person behind you, the person to either side of you is just as chosen as you are. The people who are not in this room but are out there somewhere, they are just as chosen as you. God loves them just as much as God loves you. In fact, when Jesus is asked, what is the greatest commandment? Love God. Love everybody else. What would life be like if we saw others, saw everybody in that light, this new light? Can you think of what that would look like? Well, no, of course we can't because that is not the way 
we think. We love to think God loves everybody, but God, God likes me just a little bit more than you. But it isn't true. It is so far outside of the way things are supposed to work. God's supposed to choose the best, the brightest, the biggest, the strongest, the most powerful, the most eloquent, the smartest. Nope. Nope. God looks at all of us and says, yep, you'll do. That is what election comes down to. It is all about grace. All about grace. It is a gift. A gift that was never intended, never able to stop with just us. It didn't stop with Abram. It didn't stop with Sarah. It didn't stop with Lot. It didn't stop with Isaac or Jacob or Joseph or Moses or Joshua or Caleb or David or Jeremiah or Isaiah or Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul. It will not stop with us. It comes to us, but it won't stop. God's plan has always been to spread this thing we call blessing, almost as if it were an infection, as if it were contagious, as if something, when we just come into the presence of somebody else, they're going to catch it from us. That is the way it's supposed to work. God's light and love and grace and mercy and peace are to infect the world. Our reading concludes by noting Abraham didn't say a single thing, and yet his action said everything. So Abram went. Not Abram thought about it. Not Abram considered it. Not Abram believed it. Not Abram talked with others. What do you think about this? Not that Abram launched a feasibility study. Not that Abram sent somebody ahead and said, What's it look like? Is this a safe bet? Not that Abram surveyed the field to say, eh, is there a better path out there? At the crossroads, Abraham said nothing and everything because Abram went. Abram and those closest to him they set out for God knows where, with God knows whom, with a God they did not even really fully know or worship, and they went. So often in life, we find ourselves at the crossroads, and we have a choice to make. Do I love it or list it? Do I go this way, or do I go that way? Do I take that job off? Do I go to this school, or maybe that school? Do I go to school? Do I consent to the treatment? Do I let go and let God? Do I take them back again? Do I say, I do, till death do us part? What will we do? What path will we take? Now, many of the choices we make, we'll never look back on them and say, boy, that was a life-changing decision. They're inconsequential in the larger scheme of our lives. But others, even years later, and we can think about them right now, those choices we did make, and we mark the passage of time by them, life changed in those decisions. We look back on them, and some of them we say, that was a great decision. I'd do it again. Others, we look back and say, oh, if I could just go back and choose something else. What do you look back on now? Wondering, what if? What if I chose that other thing? What if I chose that other person? What if I took that other offer? What if I traveled another path? Like that picture that was up a few moments ago of Abram and God. It was drawn as a woodcut in 1860. We see the face of God. We see the pointing finger of God. But we don't see Abram's face because he's not looking back. He's looking where God's pointing ahead. Life is lived, as has been noted by many. Not looking backward, by, but by living forward. 
In Sarai and in Abram, a barren, man, barren woman and elderly man, we find that God most often calls the helpless, the hopeless, the resourceless, the small, the insignificant, the forgotten, the useless, and in them God injects, God infects them with grace and hope and mercy and blessing. And if God did it then, if God has done that through all the pages of Scripture, what could God do with you in your life? What will God do with you when you step out of the crossroads? What is God calling you to do even now? Where is the blessing God is leading you to? What is God calling you today? Not tomorrow, not next week, not next year, today to leave behind decisively, completely and forever to let go so that you can go another way. Where is the place the people God is waiting to show you? Most of all, knowing that God has blessed you, favored you, chosen you, named you, not for your own well-being, not for your own greatness, not for your own legacy. How will you take that and infect someone else with that? The matter is not up for debate. God's blessing here with Abram, just as it is with us, never comes with the word if. Did you pick that up? God never said if you do this, Abram, then I will do that. There's a lot of passages of scripture where it says that. If you will be my people, I will be your God. If you do A, then I will do No. Whether you want it or not, God has blessed you, period, the end. It is a reality, and it is a responsibility. So what will you do with it? That's our task today, and that is our task today. Friends, as we respond to that same God who has called us and blessed us, let us choose to respond to God in song. Let us stand in body or in spirit as we are able, as we sing hymn number 45, I to the hills will lift my eyes. Please be seated. Uh, as we come to our time of prayer, uh, I thank all of you who uh, prayed for me and uh, my family this week as uh, obviously made it out and back with mom safely, but uh, certainly a lot of adjustments in life. Um, so continued prayers for us and uh, for my mom and uh, decisions we'll probably be called upon to make in uh, the days and weeks to come. Uh, we continue to pray for Cameron Harmon, uh, giving thanks for a successful second round of treatment and uh, prayers for what God will continue to do uh, 
with Cameron in fighting that illness. We pray for all who struggle with illnesses of one sort or another, uh, be they of body, mind, and spirit, uh, but especially those around the world and even around our country uh, combating the coronavirus. We pray for God's will and leading to indeed be done in our lives and for even ourselves to say yes when God asks us to go. Are there other needs and concerns or even joys and blessings we would share at this time? Yes, Nancy. Jim Markfeld? Indeed, him and family in our prayers. Indeed. Uh, we have always known we are blessed with music in this congregation, but uh, especially so in the young voices of those who worship with us as well. Rosemary. If you've never had the unique joy of being parent of a child in a high school musical production, yes. The last couple of weeks for parents, for directors, for staff, for accompanists, for anyone or everyone associated with that or with their families especially, it is, it's not even organized chaos, it's just chaos. So uh, prayers. Uh, as the Adams Family uh, production uh, wraps up their time of preparation and gets ready for their performance um, later this month. Yes, Jenny. Uh, for uh, Debbie's brother-in-law, Jason, um, for those uh, he has traveled with and is serving with uh, abroad, prayers of thanks for their safe arrival, but even more prayers for their safety and their service to our country. Yes, Sharon. That's Mary Macha, correct? Yes, who was in the hospital earlier this week, but uh, was released on Friday, and uh, thanks for the healing begun already, but prayers that that would continue, especially with the nicer weather out. Yay, spring. Oh, yes, yay, spring. Seeing and hearing no others, uh, let us carry these as well as that which remains in our hearts and minds. Let us give them over to the Lord. God, our helper, we thank you for keeping our lives always in your care and protection. And we pray for any and all who are in harm's way. Be guardian and guide, we pray, settling all our feet on your paths of righteousness and peace. We pray for all who are struggling from what is known, and especially that which is unknown, that which is spoken and that which is left unsaid, that which is big, and even that which is small, for you are our all in all. Protect not only those we love, but also the whole wide world that you so love. Help us to be instruments of your shalom, your peace, your wholeness, that peace which passes all understanding, wholeness that knows not even the idea where hope has grown tired and thin or non-existent, lift our sights so that we may see hope beyond hope, life beyond death, and you lifted up before us. It is in the name of Christ in whose name and way we now pray together as we say, 
our Father, as we sing hymn number 625, O Lord my God, how great thou art. We'll sing verses 1 and 3.
as you go out and come in, may God keep you by sunlight and moonlight. May Christ encompass you with love, and may the Holy Spirit empower you with new life now and forever. Go out in faith, trusting in God's sense of direction. Remember how much God loves this world, and so love the world in the name of Christ. For your testimony will become the good news someone else has been waiting to receive. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.